Good morning. Um, thank you very much for joining us, um, or me rather, this morning um, on uh, the, uh, a webinar which is set to tell you everything that you need to know about the upcoming uh, changes to the UK's immigration system. Um, for those of you who, who, who don't know me, my name is Charlotte Geeson. I'm Head of Employment Law and Business Immigration at, at Howarth's. Um, and everything that you need to know about the um, upcoming changes, um, in theory, I'm your, your, your woman. Um, so although um, 2020 has been taken over by the, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, Brexit has still very much been in the forefront of British politics since the UK's departure from the EU on the 31st of January uh, this year. Since our departure, we have been the subject of a transition period, um, which is due to end on New Year's Eve. Um, during the, the, the transition period, um, freedom of movement, which is one of the fundamental tenets of the European Union, which allows EU nationals to live and work in the UK freely and with limited restriction, has continued. And this, this year, um, nationals from the, the European Economic Area, or the EEA, have had the right to live and work in the UK as before. Employers have not been the subject of any significant obligations uh, in respect of the employment of EU nationals and could choose to employ um, individuals from the EU with the same considerations as they would have had when employing domestic UK nationals. From the 1st of January, however, there are going to be big changes to the UK's immigration system because that, that, that principle of freedom of movement is going to end. Um, and the UK will simultaneously introduce the, the sort of um, often referred to points based system for entry. Um, the new points-based system will bring EU citizens under the same immigration controls as the rest of the world. Um, and basically, it's going to make it much harder for employers to employ foreign nationals going forward. Um, as I say, as things currently stand, EU nationals can move to the UK to look for work with minimal restrictions. And when it comes to individuals from the rest of the world, they can come here, but they need a visa to, to enter and they are required to meet certain criteria before um, commencing employment. Under the new points-based system, anyone who is an, a, a UK citizen or someone with settled status will need a visa to enter um, and to also have been awarded a certain number of points under the new system. Um, in most cases, an employer will need to hold what is known as a sponsor license before employing any foreign national, including those from the EU. Um, the, the, the new points-based system then um, represents a pretty big change for employers who employ EU and non-EU nationals. And the biggest change will be the extension of the sponsor licensing requirement for non-EU nationals to all foreign nationals. Um, over the next sort of half hour, 40 minutes, I'm going to explain the new system, the new points based system in some further detail and try and highlight some of the things that businesses can do now to stabilise both their operations and their workforces. Um, employers reliant on EU employees should certainly look to have some kind of a plan in place as we move into 2021 to take account of the staffing and financial implications which the end of freedom of movement may have have. Um, during this session, I'm not going to be taking any live questions um, due to time constraints. However, if you do have any questions, feel free to pop them into either the, the chat box, which is at the bottom of your screen, or the Q&A box. Um, and what I'll do um, is, is pick up on these after the session um, and, and somebody will get back in touch with you to discuss those further. OK, so in terms, firstly, of the, the sort of rationale for the, the points based system, I think it's useful to have a, a sort of an understanding and awareness of what the government has kind of been thinking since um, we, we, we voted as a nation to, to exit the EU in respect to immigration. Um, 
one of the, the recognised challenges with freedom of movement is that ultimately the decision to move to the UK is largely down to an individual migrant as opposed to the UK itself. Um, with freedom of movement, then there is no guarantee that migration to the UK is going to be in the country's best interests. Um, the new points based system, however, has been described as something which kind of redresses the balance in that respect on the basis that it will still facilitate migration for employment into the UK, but at the same time will allow a greater focus on migrants entering the UK to do a specific job, uh, which is agreed in advance um, so that there is no kind of ambiguity over whether or not when a migrant enters the UK, they will actually have a job to do. Um, and, and, and therefore be able to make a, a, a meaningful contribution towards society in respect of the payment of taxes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, to, to some extent then, the new immigration system places entry and migration into the UK into the hands of employers, um, who the government obviously recognise um, as, as receiving great benefit from being able to access a global talent market, and gives employers a degree of control over whom they employ within their organisation and what roles they consider would be best filled by an individual perhaps coming from outside the um, domestic labour market. Um, all employers are potentially going to be affected by the new points based system um, because it's not only going to affect those employers who might want to explore the global labour market in the future, but it will also impact those employers who currently employ EU nationals. Um, when it comes to EU nationals who are already living and working in the UK, um, an employer's right to continue to employ them after the 1st of January 2021 will depend on the individual's own immigration status. Um, EU citizens who are already resident in the UK do have some protection um, under the, the, the Brexit transition arrangements. Um, however, that protection is not absolute and it's not automatic. Um, and if an individual doesn't comply with the new immigration requirements, then they'll be liable for deportation and the employer will be liable for uh, employing an illegal worker in, in just the same way as with other foreign workers. Um, whilst each case will, will turn on its own facts, generally speaking, um, EU citizens who have been here for five years or more will already have what is known as settled status and they'll be able to continue to live and work here without having really to do anything further. EU citizens who haven't been here for that long, however, may still be able to live and work here, but they will need to submit an application through the new European Union Settlement Scheme, or EUSS for short, um, in order to obtain the necessary permissions to be able to live and work here um, past the 1st of January. Um, Irish nationals are dealt with separately um, as they have protections which predate the transition arrangements um, and, and they can, can live and work here in exactly the same way as a British citizen would. Um, in terms of the EU settlement scheme then, the EUSS, you might have seen um, uh, television adverts uh, for, for this scheme or, or if you sign up to any sort of home office alert emails, um, a number of um, correspondence is dropping through into your inbox about this scheme. Um, this scheme, like I say, is, is the only way that existing uh, EU nationals who, 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 who are working and living here and who do not currently have settled status can stay here after January lawfully. So it's important for both individuals and for employers to be aware of the scheme. Um, the EUSS, as well as allowing individuals to remain in the UK indefinitely for, for work, will also allow um, an employee's family members to obtain immigration status um, to, to continue living, working and perhaps studying in the UK beyond the 30th of June. 2021. Um, individuals who arrive after this date, June, will not be eligible, eligible to apply or stay under the EUSS and will be captured by the new points-based licensing um, system. The application process under the EUSS, um, according to Home Office, is um, very easy to complete and it can be done online. Um, the application is free 
and there is application guidance on the gov.uk website which provides information about what details um, the applicant will need to submit with regards to identity and residence as part of that application. Um, a successful application will result in an individual obtaining either settled or pre-settled status. The EUSS will provide settled status to those who've been in the UK for a period of at least five years by this date. And if an individual receives settled status, which is also known as um, indefinite leave to remain to or uh, indefinite leave to remain or enter, um, means that there is no time limit then on, on how long they can stay in the UK um, and therefore no time limit on how long they can work for you. Um, an individual can go on then to apply for British citizenship if they want to um, and if they meet the requirements and, 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 and want to stay here on a more permanent basis. Those who haven't been in the UK for this long can use the EUSS to apply for what's known as pre-settled status. Um, EU citizens will need to apply for this status under the EUSS, even if they already have permanent residence documents, um, because indefinite leave to remain status won't be automatically conferred to them. Um, applications under the scheme are open until the 30th of June 2021, even though all the changes take place on the 1st of January, so, so don't get, don't get um, confused on that. Um, and an individual's current immigration rights won't be affected until then. So there's a bit of leeway for, for employees to kind of get themselves sorted out in terms of any application that they might need to make under the scheme. Um, and while staff shouldn't be forced to apply under the EUSS on the basis that it might amount to um, unlawful discrimination, employers can certainly signpost the EUSS to any affected employees and offer support to them when it comes to the application process. Um, I'll come on to this in a little bit more detail um, later on in the session, but in many cases, it will actually be to an employer's advantage to offer support in this nature, um, particularly where they employ overseas workers whose services they want to retain following the end of the transition period on, um, on like I say, New Year's Eve. If an individual fails to apply under the EUSS by the end of June and acquire settled status or pre-settled status, then this will, put it bluntly, render them an illegal immigrant and they will be subject to removal from the UK. Um, given an employer has specific obligations in respect of ensuring employees have proper immigration status, and again, I'll come on to that in a little bit, um, it will be really important for employers to ensure that affected employees are on top of their EUSS applications. Um, employers might even want to give consideration to writing to their employees uh, regarding the EUSS um, to ensure that A, there's an audit trail in place in case a Home Office ever sort of come looking around um, uh, and inspecting whether you have complied with immigration obligations, um, but, but also, like I say, to um, protect any existing workforce that, that, that you may want to retain following the end of the transition period. In terms of the wider immigration system and the points-based system, um, similar to existing provisions, the new points-based system will offer routes for highly skilled workers, skilled workers, students and other specialists such as global leaders and innovators. Sounds very fancy, um, but broadly speaking, for the purposes of, of, of the SME world, um, there are two main routes, um, or, or there will be two main routes for permission to work in the UK. Um, one, a, a skilled worker visa route um, for people with, with a job offer, which is akin to the, the existing tier two general um, category, and two, a highly skilled work visa route for people without a job offer, although the second category is not going to be enforced until at least 2022. The biggest shock to the system though, um, economically, culturally and socially, I think, um, will be the fact that there is not going to be any general UK work visa for lower skilled roles. Um, this coupled with the end of freedom of movement will have a potentially devastating impact on employers who rely heavily on low skilled 
foreign nationals to perform key roles within their organizations. Um, to reference, to, to reinforce the point that I made earlier about employers supporting employees with the EUSS application, um, it would genuinely therefore make sense for employers who currently have a largely low skilled and foreign um, workforce to help those individuals apply under the EUSS to secure their chances of remaining in work uh, remaining in the UK for work. Um, if you are an employer that relies heavily on a low skilled foreign workforce and you don't secure um, the, the continued service of that workforce because you fail to apply under the USS or for whatever, for whatever reason, then like I say, there's potentially going to be a huge impact upon your, your, your operations because there's not going to be the same access as there currently is to the global labour market for the lower skilled, lower talent work. You're going to have to look domestically if you want to continue operations in the UK in order to fill that gap. Um, whilst under the existing immigration system, in outside the UK already need to meet with certain criteria to work in the UK. Um, under the new system, these criteria will be subject to change um, and will, as discussed, apply to all foreign nationals. Um, a couple of dates sort of flying around, I'm aware of that. Um, but from 9am tomorrow, actually, so 1st of December, uh, foreign nationals will actually need to show that they can meet with five minimum uh, skills and salary thresholds before they can come to the UK to work. Um, these five thresholds are one, having a qualifying job offer from a qualifying employer, two, satisfying uh, applicable criminality tests, i.e. they're not a criminal. Um, three, being able to speak English to an intermediate level. Four, having a job offer from a qualifying employer which meets with the minimum salary requirements. Um, and when it comes to minimum salary requirements, there are actually two, either £25,600 or the going rate for the job for which there is separate um, guidance published. Um, there's a bit of flexibility in this because an individual can earn less, but only if they work in a shorted occupation, um, which again is listed by the government, hold a PhD which is relevant to the job, or they're a new entrant to the job market. So again, £25,500 salary, that, that's potentially going to be quite a lot higher than perhaps you will be paying your, your 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 kind of immigrant workers at this point um so so something to 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 factor in um in relation to anybody who you want to be employing going forward from outside the uk and also for anybody who you currently employ um in the uk from outside of of of, of, of the country because the new salary thresholds are going to um, attach themselves to existing work as well um so it may be that some consideration to what salaries you currently have in place need to be um, needs to be had at this point. Um, the fifth skill and salary threshold is the individual being able to demonstrate that they have academic skills to level RQF3, which is the equivalent of, of A level. And again, there is a, a list to, to support this threshold. Um, unless an individual can demonstrate that they are able to meet with these five thresholds, then any visa application going forward will fail. Um, however, two of the thresholds, i.e. qualifying job offer and meeting with minimum salary requirements, are obviously in the hands of the prospective employer. In terms, firstly, then, of being a qualifying employer, um, what this essentially means is that the employer needs to hold a sponsor licence. Um, sponsor licence actually already exist um, and employers who have wanted to employ non-EU nationals already need to have one. Um, however, as we know, the, the global immigration rules are being extended to all non-UK nationals under the new points-based system. So any uh, foreign national who wants to come in needs to be the subject of a sponsor licence going forward. Um, all businesses are eligible, eligible to become sponsors provided they don't fall foul of any criminality tests um, and provided that they haven't fallen foul previously of any immigration laws. 
in terms of what it means to be a, a sponsor license holder and, and, and what sponsor licensing actually means, um, the, the concept is, is, is fairly simple, really, in that a license allows an employer to employ individuals from the global talent pool as opposed to being restricted to the domestic labour market. Um, as well as allowing a business to employ a migrant, a sponsor license, however, also confers some pre onerous obligations onto the employer um, who essentially becomes responsible for the migrant whilst they're in the UK. Um, the, the Home Office places a burden um, on employers to actually track an individual whilst they're working for you and to also ensure that they are um, compliant with the terms of any visa that has been issued to them. Um, employers will also be expected to have robust internal HR and management systems to comply with all of the administrative licensing duties, which are pretty comprehensive. Um, and, and, and the reason that um, the Home Office sort of places these on employers is ultimately, I think, because migration is seen to benefit employers, first and foremost. Um, and as such, they should have a you know, pretty um, decent role in managing a migrant's behaviour when they have been brought to this country um, by a business um, for the purposes of providing a service. Um, the sponsor license application process is, is lengthy and it can be complicated. Um, it costs £536 for a small employer and £1,476 for others. Um, within the application process, the employer will need to decide what type of license they need. They'll also need to decide who's going to manage the license and the sponsorship obligations internally and be able to demonstrate also a full ability to comply with all of the administrative and legal responsibilities that attach to a sponsor license. Um, the Home Office will conduct background checks on all nominated individuals prior to granting a license to verify their eligibility for the roles and also for the company's eligibility to become a sponsor. Um, to make the application, you complete an online license application and provide supporting documentation to meet the necessary evidentiary requirements. Uh, a failure to submit all required documents on the first um, crack at the whip may result in an application being delayed or rejected um, and potentially further costs um, being incurred. Um, following the receipt of these documents, the application, the organisation may then also be subject to a compliance visit from a UK VI who will assess whether or not to grant the sponsorship licence. Um, the the licence process typically takes about eight weeks to process or 12 weeks if a pre-licence compliance visit is made. Um, but at the moment, um, now sort of employers are turning their attention to the immigration changes. There's a, a bit of a backlog. Um, so if you are going to be needing an ability to recruit from outside after uh, the first of January 2021, then you really need to be giving, to some, uh, giving some thought to make an application at this stage, because it's likely to be maybe February, possibly March, before you actually get that license as things currently stand. Um, once an employer has a sponsor license, then it's valid for four years. So you don't just do all that work for nothing. Um, and during this time, an employer can employ as many migrants as it wishes or as few um, to fulfill whichever roles um, it, it, it has available within its organisation. Um, obviously, any job offer needs to meet with the minimum salary thresholds, so like I say, £25,600 or the going rate for the job. Um, so that must be borne in mind when you are embarking upon any um, recruitment process. Um, again, just to reiterate, there is no automatic right now to bring migrants into the workplace to low skilled and low paid jobs. Um, so some thought to perhaps how you're going to potentially manage the fallout of that may need to be had. Um, if you are already a sponsor because you already recruit globally, then you won't need to reapply for um, a further license. But obviously, you should keep an eye on the um, expiry date of, uh, of your existing documentation. Um, if you are thinking of transferring people from a group company in the EU to your UK office, that will obviously be captured by the licensing provisions. Um, and, and whilst you might not necessarily need a brand new one, you're probably going to have to extend the terms of your existing one. 
Um, so again, just, just check the terms of anything that you currently have in place to um, ascertain your obligations in that respect. I think in terms of sort of HR practice, the, 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 perhaps one of the biggest issues that um, the new points-based system is going to have is, is uh, you know, in respect of a, a business's ability to recruit um, effectively and also to, to retain. Um, on the recruitment side, I think if a business is needing to recruit from the EU, then as things stand, obviously employment could start immediately. From January, though, an, an individual will need that permission from the Home Office to take a job, um, which will be the subject of a whole lot of legal assessment. Um, and an employer will obviously have a lot of extra things to think about, such as fees for the licence, its awareness and compliance of its immigration obligations, both in terms of managing the migrant when they're here um, and also in terms of, of um, sort of general immigration obligations um, and also how it will track migrants when here, you know, like I say a, a fairly onerous obligation really. Um, on the retention side, particularly in respect of those low skilled, low paid migrant workers, if you do want to retain them, then you need to make sure that these employees understand that you know, their time in the UK might be limited. They might also need to apply under the EUSS and also what you can be doing to kind of help support them in respect of that application process. Um, when I was doing the research for this, this webinar, um, according to the, the Federation of Small Businesses, 26% um, of employers employ at least one EU national, and that percentage rate goes up when you're looking purely at the SME um, market. So the changes are likely to have um, you know, an immediate impact upon a pretty hefty section of, of, of UK business. Um, how do I find out who the foreign nationals are in my workforce? Um, not a question, ideally, that any employer would be asking um, on the basis that irrespective of the upcoming changes, all employers actually have an existing duty to prevent illegal working, which requires employers already to carry out specific right to work checks on all prospective employees, whether they're British uh, citizens, EU citizens and, or, or, or non-EU um, national, um, in order to ascertain their identity and also to ascertain whether they have a right to work in the UK. So like I say irrespective of, of, of the upcoming changes, there shouldn't actually be anybody in any an organisation whose um, identity, nationality hasn't already been pre-identified. However, um, things can slip through the net, I, I accept that. Um, and in terms of the right to work check-in process, um, which I say currently exists, it's not currently the subject of any changes in January um, and the obligations will remain the same as we move into 2021. Um, I think it's important for employers to understand what those obligations are. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time just sort of talking to you about that. Um, but ultimately, under the process, employers are required to conduct basic documentation checks on all of their employees um, at the recruitment slash onboarding stage. Um, for those of you like me who are a little bit geeky, I suppose the right to work provisions are set out under sections 15 to 25 of the Immigration, Asylum and Nationality Act 2006, if you fancy a read. Um, but in summary, um, the, the, the sort of associated home office guidance, which give effect to, to those provisions, sets out the employer's duty in, in, in three key steps. Step one is known as obtain. Um, and this, you know, as it says on the tin, refers to the obtaining of appropriate documentation from the individual to whom you are seeking to offer employment. Um, the evidentiary requirement on the individual is to provide documents from the Home Office prescribed lists, which are known as list A and list B. Um, I don't have time today to go through the lists in full during the session, but they can be accessed via the gov.uk website. And obviously, I'm happy to talk to anyone about any right to work obligations outside this webinar if, 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 if you would like to. So feel free to, um, to get in touch. Um, when it comes to obtaining the documentation, I would advise that you obtain it before the individual actually starts working for you, even at interview stage. Um, not only will this sort of early doors approach um, help you to meet with your legal obligations, but it will also serve as a preventative measure um, 
uh, in case, you know, for example, uh, interview stage, a, a candidate you really wish to hire um, does actually require um, a, a permit to be here. Um, it buys you some time um, and allows you to kind of, you know, get uh, certain processes in motion when it comes to visas and things like that, um, you know, well in advance of, of, of a decision being made about, about job offer. Um, it might be worth looking then at your recruitment processes that, that, that you already have in place to find out where right to work check-in obligations naturally fit for you. Um, there's no sort of right or wrong really as long as they're done before the, the employee starts work and probably on that basis leaving things till the day of induction is arguably too late. Um, the second stage in the process is the checking process. Um, this involves checking the documents that you've obtained in the employee's presence. Um, you should ensure that any photographs are the same as the person in front of you. And you might also want to feel any documents. Um, sometimes the documents feel can give its authenticity away. Um, and obviously look at them carefully to make sure that um, all the pages are there. There are no spelling mistakes in the detail. Um, where a document has holograms, tilt, tilt the document and, uh, and check the lighting on it. Um, the Home Office doesn't expect an employer to be, um, you know, a, a sort of the Hercule Poirot of uh, investigating somebody's right to work, um, nor does the Home Office expect you to be an expert in, in fraudulent paperwork. However, what the Home Office does expect an employer to do is carry out these initial um, preliminary checks to see if something feels off. And generally speaking, you'll get that kind of feeling. Um, and if you do, then that is when you then have to take things further um, and um, potentially inform, inform the Home Office. Um, the third step in the right to work checking process is, is what's known as the retain process, uh, the retain step. Um, and this involves an employer retaining copies of the documentation that it has obtained and recording the date of the check. That's really important. Um, the Home Office place great store on um, uh, date uh, of checking. Um, depending on the individual's immigration status at the time of the check, there will be different demands on the type of documents to be checked and retained. Um, and again, list A, list B gives the um, specific guidance in, 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 in those sorts of circumstances. Um, the Home Office does embrace computer technology and there is an online employer checking service available too. Um, the employer checking service is a free online service from the Home Office designed to enable employers to meet their duty to conduct the right to work checks. Um, an individual does need to give the employer permission to view their details online. Um, but where this is done, then the employer can use the online service as the single method of verifying an employee's permission to work. Um, where that individual has um, either a, a biometric residence permit, a biometrics residence card, or pre-settled or settled status under the EU settlement scheme. Um, if an online check isn't possible, then the employer should obviously continue to perform the, the sort of manual document checks in the same way. Um, as an aside, uh, the government has also issued updated guidance for employers carrying out right to work checks during the COVID pandemic, um, which seeks um, or, or which includes rather seeking uh, to uh, review documentation digitally. Um, uh, it allows employers to make checks on a video call as opposed to needing to be face, uh, face to face. Um, and it gives further guidance as to what um, to do if someone can't provide any accepted documents because they're a million miles away and travel's um, not permitted. Um, again, feel free to, to contact me um, direct if you want to talk about right to work in, in the sort of pandemic climate in any further detail. Um, employers who fail in their duty to prevent illegal working, so who basically fail to carry out their right to work checks, face pretty severe criminal and civil sanctions. Um, a failure to perform a right to work check, so not even employing someone illegally, can in itself result in um, a, a large number of sanctions, including um, a fine of up to £20,000 per employee. So if you're a, a business that employs, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, 50 
uh, any number of employees really and you haven't carried out right to work checks on any of them then in theory you, you're potentially on the hook for a, a twenty thousand pound fine for each of those individuals um employers who have knowingly employed someone illegally and who can't show that they actually carried out right to work checks will be liable to an unlimited fine or imprisonment um, following conviction on indictment, uh, an employer may also be subject to a, a, an imprisonment period of five years. Um, the Home Office might seek to prosecute um, or remove from the UK, or both, anyone who is found to be working illegally in the UK. Um, and also uh, the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002 can come into play to seize any wages earned through any illegal employment. Um, so right to work checks and um, a, a very sort of simple process, really, but a really important thing to get right, not only in the context of existing immigration laws, but also in the context of, of you know, the changes which we're going to be seeing in 2021. Um, as I've said, then, when it when it when it comes to an employer's obligation to prevent illegal working and, and the duty to carry out right to work checks post transition, employers will continue to be liable. So everything of what I've just talked through will continue to apply. Um, employers will still need to carry out checks to ascertain their employees' right to live and work here. Um, and um, an employer will still be able to check an EEA's national, uh, an EEA's national's passport or national ID card until the 31st of June in order to um, fulfill their right to work obligations. Um, from the 1st of July, um, employers will no longer be able to accept passports alone as evidence of a right to work in the UK. They'll need to see proof of immigration status. Um, just on a final point in terms of right to work, um, do remember that you obviously have a duty not to discriminate against any EU, EEA or Swiss citizens. Um, obviously, you have a duty to discriminate against, um, not to discriminate against any foreign national, uh, whether they're within the EU or otherwise. Um, there may well be um, a temptation to ask EU workers for evidence of their settled status, but you mustn't do this until after the 30th of June 2021. Um, like I say, their existing passport ID documentation will be sufficient to meet with the, the right to work obligations. Um, so just ensure that you continue to treat all workers in the same way as we approach um, the sort of final um, uh, transition dates. In terms of what, what you can do to kind of get your business ready for the um, immigration changes, I think workforce planning has to be up there. Um, SMEs are, are already in very challenging times with COVID, but it's going to be really important still for businesses to understand who they currently employ and who they might want to employ going forward. Um, employers need to be clear, I think, on what parts of their business have a, a high number of EU workers and what they're doing. Um, if the workers are skilled, check for a work permit and make sure these people earn enough to meet with the minimum salary threshold which is going to be introduced. Um, this may require a look at budget planning. Um, and, and whilst um, this sort of level of workforce planning isn't perhaps an easy task, particularly when you don't have a crystal ball, um, I think even a recognition of the potential implications which the changes will have on your business will be better than nothing at this stage. Um, if you are looking at employing foreign nationals, including EU citizens who are not already living in the UK, then you'll need a sponsor license. So I think the second thing that you can do is, is, is look into that. Um, most SMEs don't have a license as things stand, but getting to grips with this duty is potentially going to be really key. Um, as I said, there are really severe sanctions for getting illegal working wrong. Um, and at the very least, you need to be aware of your obligations um, because obviously there, there's a, you know, an amount of time which um, a sponsor license um, needs to take, um, uh, rather uh, an amount of time which a sponsor license application will take up. So if you are looking at a, a recruitment process, then you may need to you know, have an awareness of the sponsor license and in your mind because it might be a relevant factor for you know, a particular um, role that, that, that you are recruiting for at some point. Um, 
getting a license comes obviously with with some various uh, duties and the immigration system can be uh, complicated and um, if you're not um sort of familiar with the system then you should seek advice and 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 obviously it's something that we can help you with um if if necessary um the third thing that i think employers can do is encourage it's sort of EU citizen contingent um, to apply to the EU settlement scheme. This is ultimately going to protect your existing workforce. And if they're low skilled in nature, this is going to be really valuable because, like I say, this the source of cheap labour ultimately is going to be switched off at the end of 2020. And um, if you're thinking of recruiting or transferring EU citizens to the UK, then consider doing this before the end of 2020 so that they qualify too. Um, I think sort of coupled on to that, a, a consideration now of what your recruitment process is for 2021 and beyond might look like. Um, if you do have that low skilled workforce, which I keep talking about, perhaps start looking now at what recruitment processes you can introduce to help you attract more domestic talent or whether, you know, more sort of you know, severely, actually, you know, whether the UK is, is still going to be the best place to do your work if, if the restricted access to the EU market is going to be problematic. Um, in terms of, of, of how, how we can help, um, obviously, how us, we, we, we bring together expertise in UK immigration law, employment and HR, and we're working with the SME market to advise on the implications of the new points-based system on recruitment, onboarding, workforce planning, um, and we can provide a, a full business immigration service um, from ensuring that your right to work and HR procedures are in place, through to supporting you with sponsor licensing applications, and advising on the management of um, any migrants that you employ, um, any advice which you might need on the points-based system, the EUSS, or business immigration generally, then um, obviously we are more than happy to help, um, so please don't hesitate to contact either myself directly or, or Howard to discuss. Um, hopefully you you enjoyed that if immigration law is enjoyable um, but if not that you at least gain, uh, gain some some new uh, information from that which you, you know, weren't previously aware of. Um, I'm going to say goodbye um, and hand you over to my colleague Justine um, who is going to run a, a couple of uh, short polls um, just before she um, pops her, her, her face up on the screen so um, if you are happy to participate in those it would be really um, really appreciated um, but yeah so uh, bye from me for now and um, thank you again for um, for joining it's it's much appreciated. Hi everyone, hopefully you can hear me and you can see the poll that I've just um, popped in front of you. So I'll leave that up for about a minute. Um, if you can answer those questions, that would be um, great. And then I've just got a couple of things um, to go through with you once you've done that. So I'll give you a minute just to um, have a look at the questions, answer, um, and I'll look out for those coming through. Looks like they're coming through. <laughs> Perfect. Right, so I've just got a screen that I'm just going to share with you. Um, my video on, hello everyone. Um, so I'll just share my screen with you, just bear with me. So hopefully you can see my screen. So it's just um, a quick recap, brilliant. Thank everyone for attending. Um, keep an eye out for our Q&A blog um, and the webinar itself as we do record it and send that out to you as well. Um, so yeah, for, for clients of Howarth's, um, as you know, you can contact Charlotte by phone or email for any follow-up advice if you've got any more questions that you need answering. Um, we do offer a range of immigration services. Um, so for any inquiries at all, you can email myself or Charlotte or give us a call on 01274 864 if you are interested in finding out more. Okay. 
And um, for those of you that haven't seen, we've got some more upcoming events. Um, so we've got an Essential Skills for Managers ILM course coming up in the new year. Um, it's an hour session a day, Monday to Friday. Um, and at the end of that course, you do receive an ILM um, certificate of um, it's a development award which is really handy to have um, just to show that you you know you are trained for the task uh, we've also got a keeping home workers engaged and motivated webinar running on the 4th of February as well and we've got afternoon and morning sessions for those so if you are interested in attending um, you can email me at justine at howarths uk.com or you can visit the website um, to see if there's any more coming up just on a final note, if you know anyone who you think would benefit from our services, we are offering a refer and receive. Um, so if you do refer someone and they come on board as a Howard's client, um, they'll receive or you'll receive um, a £150 voucher of your choice. Um, so I believe I have gone through everything there so hopefully you've enjoyed today as I say any questions you've got um fire them through and we'll do our best to answer them um but for now see you um and thank you for joining